All right, this is the uh, book of Galatians uh, for beginners. It's the official title of the, of the series. This is lesson number one in that series. Uh, and of course, it'll be the, uh, usually the introduction and the outline I try to do in the first lesson. Uh, I want to begin by saying that one of the very first attacks against Christianity came directly against the gospel itself from people within the church. You would think that the attack you know, against the gospel would come from outside the church, but the very first really dangerous attack came from people who were members of the church. The attack that I'm talking about came from Jewish Christians who began to insist that Gentiles, you know, the Jews, there were the Jews and then there, were everybody, there was everybody else. So the Jews saw the world pretty much in two parts. There's there, there us, the Jews, and then the Gentiles, everybody else. Didn't matter what nationality or country, if you were not a Jew, you were a Gentile. So Jewish Christians began to insist that Gentiles who wanted to become Christians had to become Jews first before becoming Christians. This was one of the very first attacks against the gospel in the very young church. This meant that for a Gentile to become a Christian, that person first had a man, first had to be circumcised and then could be baptized. This is the proposal, this was the teaching that began to emerge in certain parts of in certain churches, and we'll, in the Galatian region anyways, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Gentile Christians in the region of Galatia were being influenced by this pressure, and so Paul writes this epistle, epistle to the Galatians, to respond to the problems that were being caused by this particular teaching. So in this epistle, in our study, I have several goals that I want us to pursue. First of all, we're going to examine the implications and dangers of this type of teaching, certainly for the Galatians, as well as the dangers of the spirit of this teaching in every generation. There's no one around today that is forcing people to be circumcised in order to become Christians. That's gone, you know, that's gone away. But the spirit of that remains. People who insist on certain you know, pre-qualifications before you become a Christian. Certain pre-qualifications that are not in the Bible. Things that men have made up. So the spirit of that idea still lives with us today and Galatians is a great book, great epistle to learn how to kind of counter that type of spirit. Also want to review Paul's teaching on the doctrine of justification by faith which is the heart and soul of the gospel. Some people say, wait a minute, justification by faith? Isn't that a Baptist doctrine? No. That's a, that's a Bible doctrine. Justification by faith is the, is the heart and soul of the gospel. And Paul, you know, remember I told you in another class, every book has a theme. And if you know what the themes are, even if you can't memorize all the scriptures in that book, if you understand what the themes of every book are, when something comes up and you're studying or discussing someone with, something with someone, if you, if you sense that they're having an issue you know, with the faith issues and how we're justified by faith, you know that the book that you need to look at with them is the epistle to the Galatians, because he deals with that idea uh, in this particular epistle. Thirdly, we're going to study the true meaning of freedom and how it is expressed in Christian lives, because Paul also talks about freedom here very much in this epistle. And then we're going to learn about Paul's early life um, as a Christian himself. All right, so let's talk about Galatia, just some basic things here. Galatia was a Roman province in Asia Minor, and the letter to the Galatians was actually addressed to the cities in the southern part of Galatia, where Paul had established several congregations on his first missionary journey. So there was no church named you know, Church of Galatia. Galatia was a region, there were many churches in that region, so this letter is to all those churches in that region. Um, there are four that we know of. All of them established between 44 and 47 AD in what is now known as modern day Turkey. 
the four congregations uh, that we know of, Antioch, we read about that in Acts 13, uh, Iconium, Acts 13.51, Lystra, Acts 14.8, and Derbe, Acts 14.19-21. Those are the four congregations in Galatia uh, to whom this uh, epistle is addressed. As Luke tells the story in Acts 13, the Jews, you know, they were happy to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. These Jews who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire were happy to receive Paul and to hear of the coming of the Messiah. So they, were, they, they accepted that good news, many of them. They became offended, however, and jealous when they realized that the Gentiles, right? Remember I told you, those are non-Jews of any nationality. They became upset when they realized that the Gentiles were also included in the promise of God and they also were accepting Christ in great numbers because as far as the Jews were concerned, the Messiah, that's our Messiah. We're the ones waiting for the Messiah. We're the ones that put the work in, you know, the prophets, and we're the ones that have been you know, punished, and we're the ones that were the exodus and in the desert. And all. We're the ones, he's our Messiah, he's not your Messiah. So there was trouble there at the beginning. This protest by the Jews took the form of a group that insisted that if the Gentiles were to become Christians, they had to first obey Jewish laws and customs to earn that right. So a lot of it was cultural, a certain cultural pride mixed with religious fervor. So this probably involves circumcision and obedience to food laws and various you know, Jewish religious customs and so on and so forth. So upon his return, talking about Paul now, upon his return to Jerusalem from that region uh, and from the work that he had done there, Paul goes back to Jerusalem to report on his ministry. Now Paul has faced uh, is faced rather with this backlash in the form of a group within the church referred to as the circumcision party. They were called either Judaizers or circumcision party. So Judaizers because they wanted people to you know, embrace Judaism before they became Christians. Circumcision party because the focal point of their message was you know, the battleground if you wish was uh, the necessity to be circumcised before you were, before you were baptized. So in Acts chapter 15, we read about Paul and the other apostles as well as the elders in the church of Jerusalem discussing and trying to resolve this matter. At this meeting, Paul recounts the blessings and power of God uh, in preaching to the Gentiles. Mean, he tells them, look what we've done. We've done miracles among the Gentiles. They're accepting Christ in numbers. We've planted churches. Surely this can't be wrong. And he's saying to the apostles that his ministry among them was legitimately ordained by God. In addition to this, God, through the Spirit, sent Barnabas and I out to do this very work. As a matter of fact, he can, uh, he's also recounting that he was originally called to this work. That's why he was called. And during that meeting in Acts 15, Peter also stands with Paul and confirms that Paul had indeed been sent specifically to the Gentiles by God's command. What's really interesting about, James, uh, about um, Acts 15 is that Paul, the apostle, you know, who had done miracles, he speaks, and Peter, you know, the apostle, he speaks, and yet it's left to James. Never heard any miracles from James. He wasn't an apostle, and yet he was a leader you know, of the church. James, one of the elders, stands up and he's the one that makes the suggestion that they should write a letter to the church where the Gentiles are, confirming Paul's ministry among them and reassuring them that they not be troubled by any requirement to be circumcised. So this letter was delivered to the church at Antioch. Uh, Antioch was not in in the Galatian region, it was in, in the north there, but there was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles in that particular in that particular church. So the letter to the Galatians was written soon after this meeting. That's the point. That's why I'm mentioning this meeting. The elders 
The apostles discuss it, come to a solution, write a letter of instruction to the church in Antioch and so on and so forth, not requiring the Gentiles to be circumcised. And so based on this, Paul himself writes another letter and this time addresses it to the churches in Galatia, okay? around 50, 51 AD. Um, and uh, what's interesting also is that the letter to the Galatians, uh, if not the earliest of the New Testament books, certainly one of the earliest New Testament writings to be circulated. You know, we start Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we think, oh, Matthew was the first letter. Well, no. No, Matthew was not the first letter written. It's just, it's grouped together you know, with the gospel records, okay? I think Matthew simply because He's addressing the Jews, okay? Uh, Mark's addressing the, uh, the, the Gentiles, so to speak. Uh, uh, you know, Luke is giving history. John is talking from a philosophical perspective, the gospel from a philosophical perspective. Anyways, the idea is that the letter to the Galatians may have been one of the earliest letters to begin circulating in the, in the churches. And it was important because the gospel itself was being attacked. If, if the Judaizers and the, the circumcision party, if they won, they would destroy what had been established uh, by the apostles thus far. So the objective that Paul is trying to accomplish with the letter is to explain to the Galatians uh, several things. He wants to explain to them the blessings that accompany salvation that these blessings were earned by Jesus' perfect faith and obedience. And this is the most important teaching in the New Testament concerning salvation. If someone were to say to you, I want you to rank the importance of teachings, the number one most important teaching concerning the gospel is that it is Jesus who makes restitution for all sin on the cross and that His work on the cross fulfills completely God's requirement for man's salvation. Boy, you attack that, you take that apart, you got nothing left. And I'll show you why a little later on. Also that we obtain the blessings because we are associated or united or identified to Christ by faith. That's the other important idea. We're associated with Him, we're in Christ. There's so many different ways of saying the same thing, and I've said that to you before in, you know, in different classes. The Bible says sometimes the same idea, it gives it different words, different approaches, always talking about the same thing. And so the blessings that we receive, we receive because we are in Christ, identified with Christ, believe in Christ, have faith in Christ. You can say it 10 different ways, it's always it's always the same thing. And that faith is expressed biblically through repentance and baptism and of course, faithfulness to Christ. Thirdly, third idea, third objective. We cannot earn these blessings by works of the law or ceremony or benevolence apart from Christ. And finally, those who try to do it this way will fail, and not only fail, they'll be condemned for it. And you'll see how Paul, how strongly he words this condemnation. If you look at the back of your, uh, you look at the back of your sheet, you have um, the outline for this epistle, very simple outline. There's the greeting, which we'll take a look at tonight. Chapter one, one to five. The rebuke, the rebuke, meaning he's rebuking that church, those churches, for beginning to fall away and beginning to adopt these ideas that have, been, that have penetrated the church. Then there's the personal history, Paul's personal history, and there's a reason he gives his own personal history, because in attacking the gospel, the people who were teaching this were also attacking him and his legitimacy. So he gives a bit of background about, him, about himself. 
Uh, then, of course, the meat of this epistle, the heart and soul of it, a discourse on justification by faith. Chapter 215 to 431. Right here, brothers and sisters, this is the heart and soul. You want to peel the onion, go right to the center, it's right there. And then, of course, exhortations at the end, greetings and so on and so forth. All right, so let's, uh, let's do the greeting tonight. We'll have time to do the, uh, the greeting anyways. Beginning in chapter one, verse one. He says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So Paul reaffirms his position as apostle because the Judaizers, and I'm going to go back and forth, I'm not going to explain this too many times. When I say the Judaizers and when I say the circumcision party, I'm talking about the same people, okay? Because the Judaizers, in questioning the gospel, to the, to, the, uh, to the Gentiles, as I mentioned before, they were also questioning Paul's legitimacy. You know, what he's preaching is not really the gospel. We've got the gospel. So you, you attack Paul's teaching, you're attacking him too. Now he did this in letters where his authority was questioned. In other words, he, you know, he showed his credentials as a genuine apostle. And he did this where, as I say, his authority was questioned or where he was not well known. The letter to the Romans, for example. He didn't know those people. Uh, first and second Corinthians, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, right? But he refrained from doing this in churches where he was already accepted, Philippians. He goes straight into a compliment. He goes straight into loving on the Philippians because he knew them and they knew him, they accepted him. First and second Thessalonians, same idea. He reminds them first of all that his apostleship was received from Jesus Christ and God in the same way as the other apostles received their apostleship from Jesus. He, he doesn't say, I got, I got my apostleship the same way as Peter did, but that's what he, he's implying. If you accept Peter's authority, well, you accept mine too, because I've gotten my commission the same way Peter got his commission directly from Jesus. In other words, he was not appointed by the church council. You may be wondering, why was I talking about the church council and the meeting in Acts 15? He wanted to let the Galatian churches know he wasn't some sort of envoy from the apostles you know, to give this message. He was an apostle. He had legitimacy. He didn't need a letter of recommendation from the church in Jerusalem to say and teach what he was teaching. And also, he was not appointed by Peter as a messenger. Notice he says, the agent, I, uh, not sent from men or through the agency of man, meaning the other apostles, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. They're the ones who appointed me, he says, as an apostle. Now, it's important to establish this because apostleship gave one the right to speak with authority in the name of Jesus. And Paul claims this authority based on his legitimate and genuine apostleship received from Christ. And here's what's not written here. Unlike the Judaizers, they didn't receive any approval from any of the apostles or any divine appointment from anyone. They were self-appointed. So he begins on the attack right away. Very first line, you know, offense. He begins with an offense. So Paul does not deny the apostleship of the other apostles, but he does not recognize any authority over himself by any other group or apostle except the gospel itself and Jesus himself. Those are the authority. The gospel is the authority over me. Jesus is the authority over me, not the other apostles and certainly not the Judaizers. Okay. So his reference to the resurrection is the mark of the true apostle the personal witness of this event. He mentions it not as doctrine, but as one who confirms this doctrine as a chosen eyewitness. He says, through Jesus Christ, who raised him from the dead. He's not teaching you ought to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's not what he's doing here. He's saying, I saw Jesus raised from the dead. I saw the risen Jesus. And the only apostles that have authority are the ones that saw the risen Jesus. 
That's what, he's, that's what he's saying here. If anyone says, who gives you the right to be an apostle? Well, I, I saw the risen Jesus. That was, that's what gives me the right. And of course, his authority in doing miracles and so on and so forth to confirm his apostleship. Verse two, we did say this was a textual study. <laughs> Verse two, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. We don't know who the quote brothers with him are, only that they're, you know, they're, they share in the greeting. Paul reserves the title churches in God or Christ in addressing the Galatians, since they are on the road to apostasy. He doesn't refer to them as that. He merely refers to them as churches located in Galatia. In other places, you know, he says, to the church in Christ, to the church of God, you know, at Philippi or here or there. But when he's talking to these guys, he doesn't, he doesn't say that. He says, yeah, the churches, those groups that are in Galatia. It's correct, it's geographical, but it's not complementary. So he's talking to those churches, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, you know. Verses three to four, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. So he offers a, a usual blessing that they receive favor from God and the peace that comes with the favor. This favor and peace is connected to Jesus Christ, of whom Paul says two things here. One, that He is Lord. He uses the term to signify deity and equality with God, the term kurios in the Greek. The term kurios originally had secondary meanings, but Jesus and later on the apostles and disciples came to use this word when referring to Jesus and His divinity. And then the second thing that he says about Jesus very briefly is that he reviews the work of salvation and its ultimate results that, uh, that Jesus has accomplished. What, what work is that? Well, first of all, that he offered himself as a sacrifice for sins. Now he's going to build his argument on this basis later on in this epistle, so we need to kind of keep that in mind. Remember how Paul writes, and I've told you this in other epistles. You know, he sets up a, 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 like an idea over here, he kind of sets it up and he explains it and then he, and then he snaps another idea over here and explains that and then he builds a bridge to another idea with a word or a phrase you know, and you got another idea and then he'll add another layer of, of ideas in order to give you the, the whole picture. So now he's laying down two basic ideas. One, uh, that Jesus is the Lord uh, and then secondly, uh, the work that he's done, that he's offered himself as a sacrifice. This is the core of the gospel, the atoning death, the payment of death, the earning of forgiveness by Jesus on our behalf. A lot of times what people, the mistake that people make is that they confuse repentance with restitution. They think that their repentance needs to consist of restitution. The, the restitution part, you know, what people owe God, the moral debt that they owe God for their sins, the restitution, Jesus makes 100% of the restitution required for all of our sins through His cross. Okay, that's, that's basic, that's 100% He makes restitution. Someone will say, well, what's repentance then? Well, repentance is the recognition that you caused that cross, the recognition that you are a sinner, the recognition that you can't live this life, the decision that you will begin to live your life in the knowledge and the understanding that you're a sinner and you need Jesus Christ you know, to make restitution for you. And someone says, well, don't you try to get better? Well, sure, of course. I used to take drugs, I don't take drugs anymore. I used to swear, I try not to swear anymore, except when I'm playing golf and then it's a little more difficult. But anyways, you know, you know what I'm saying. I, uh, I was sexually impure. Well now I, I'm going to work on being sexually pure and try to avoid you know, temptations. But doing that doesn't make restitution 
for my sins in the past. The cross makes restitution for my sins in the past and my sins in the future. Well then what am I doing repenting? I am saying to God, I believe. That's what I'm doing when I repent. Every time I say no to this temptation or to this failing, I am saying, I believe God. I believe and I'm, I'm wanting to demonstrate my faith by actively pursuing righteousness and holiness. Okay? So many people, their Christian life is so burdensome because they think that their repentance is actually making restitution for what they have done. And you know what? Sometimes you can make restitution. I stole $20 out of the wallet of a friend of mine you know, when I was a kid and when I became a Christian, I said, you know, buddy, 10 years ago, you know, I, I did a bad thing. I took money out of your pocket and I just want to give you back 20 and I'm giving you 50 in interest, whatever. You're making some sort of restitution. But could you really make restitution for everything? We know that, right? You had an abortion. Okay, how are you going to make restitution for that? You told a lie about somebody. How are you going to make restitution for that? You hurt yourself. You hurt your parents. You, know, you put your parents in the poorhouse because of your crazy life. How are you going to make restitution for that? They're dead. So we need to understand that it's the cross of Christ that makes all the restitution for our sins. My repentance is is a continual act of faith that I'm saying, I believe God, and I'll show you I believe because I'm making an effort to do what's right and to live, to live righteously. And with the Holy Spirit's help, I, I grow in that ability. Okay? So, back to Galatians. What is he saying about salvation? Well, that Jesus offers Himself as the sacrifice, as the restitution for sin. B, that His sacrifice enables our salvation, it's what it makes possible. Uh, he delivers us from the evil age, sin, condemnation. Say it any way that you wish. The work of Jesus and subsequent gospel is what sheds light in the world of darkness and ignorance and sinfulness. Before Jesus came, the world truly was in darkness and ignorance of God's will. They didn't know what God's will was. The Jews were the only light. In the Bible, right, they call the Jews the light of the Gentiles. They're the only ones that had light, that had truth. And Christianity is the religion of light and truth. You don't believe that? Take a look at the other countries that have different religions. I don't mean different types of Christianity. I mean you know, Hinduism and, 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 and Islam. And so on. Look at those countries. Look at those nations. See the difference. And then he says, and all of this is done according to the will and the purpose of God. All of human history has worked towards this end, Paul says to them. So in verse five, he says, to whom be the glory forevermore, amen. Man was created in order to give glory to God. You know, if, if your teenager ever says to you, mom, dad, you know, why am I here? And a lot of times, you know, the parents don't know what to answer. Well, I don't know, maybe if you go to college, you'll understand, perhaps you'll become an engineer, and you know, maybe you'll, no. You are here to glorify God. As a homemaker, as a doctor, as an engineer, as a lawyer, as a cop, as a tradesman, as a plumber, as a nurse, as a banker, as a preacher, as a teacher, you are here to glorify God. Boy, if parents could just get that idea into the psyche of young people, the rest of it would take care of itself. This is the basic meaning to life, giving God glory and honor. And in finding that meaning, man finds peace and joy and a sense of purpose and eternal life. Paul recognizes this fact and he reaffirms it in his greeting and also in his assessment of the things done by God for man through Christ. 
You know, God deserves glory for what He has done and He receives the glory that He is due through the countless number of saints who glorify Him because of and through Jesus Christ. Every time I say no to sin, every time I lift my voice in song, every time I serve in the name of Christ a glass of cold water to someone, two dollars to the guy on the side of the road who's panhand, everything done in the name of Christ glorifies God. Why does this make me happy and satisfied? Uh, because that's why I'm here. <laughs> God is so glorious I mean, if he doesn't receive glory, the universe will blow up. What do you think Jesus meant when he said, you know, if these little kids don't cry out to me, these rocks, the, the rocks themselves are going to begin praising me. God's creation must honor him in some way. And imagine, we've been created in order to experience that giving of honor, which gives to us the highest level of our being, the highest level of our feeling, of our nature. And then he says, Amen. Amen comes from the Hebrew word which meant surely, or to be firm, or steady, or trustworthy. The um, anglicized version uh, of the Hebrew word amen, pronounced amen in Hebrew and was translated to Greek and Latin and English. It wasn't actually translated, it was transliterated. You know, like baptism, baptizo, the Greek word baptizo. If they translated baptizo, it would be to immerse. Repent and be immersed in the name of Jesus, right? But they didn't do that. When the translators came to that word, they didn't translate it, they transliterated it. They just made an English word out of the Greek word. So baptizo became baptized. Well, in the same way, amen, instead of verily and truly, it just became amen. It was transliterated. It became an English word. Used as a responsive formula, with which Jewish, the Jewish listener acknowledged the validity of an oath or a, or a curse or a willingness to accept the consequences. Now the New Testament usage as agreement with an offering of praise or blessing is how we use it now. It was used in synagogue worship in this way uh, and as uh, the Jews were uh, converted, the saying of amen at the end of praise and blessings and prayers and teaching and so on and so forth, it kind of filtered into Christian worship. The Jews began saying it, but eventually Christians began to say the, uh, began to say the same thing. Paul uses it in this way at the end of his greeting, confirming that it is a sure and trustworthy thing that that Jesus died for our sins. Amen. Verily, truly, for sure, absolutely. That Jesus was resurrected. Amen. Verily, truly, for sure, absolutely. That this was all done according to God's will. Verily, truly, surely, of course. That God deserves glory for all of this. Amen. Verily, truly, absolutely, for sure. So Jesus used it to underscore His words and prophecy. You know, many times Jesus would begin something by saying, verily, verily, I say unto you. Well, what He was saying was, amen and amen, I say unto you. So He used it in that way. The apostles used it in their writings in regards of blessings and praise and, and teachings. Amen to this or that. The early church used it to signal their approval of what was being preached and emphasized their faith in what was being taught. So if the prophet or the teacher or the evangelist or the apostle was teaching, the church would say, Amen. We agree, we accept, this is true, this is of God. So to say Amen in church, this is a you know, biblical, respectful, encouraging way to demonstrate agreement and enthusiasm for what is being prayed about or taught, or preached, or sung. We, we, need, we need more of it. So if you want to show approval or joy in worship and have the chance, you know there's this big argument about applauding in church? 
right? I've seen people write articles about it. I've seen churches almost split over the idea, you know? Something happens in church and some people applaud and some say, that's a sin, you're not allowed to applaud. How do we resolve this? Well, I think we resolve this by understanding that applause is the secular way of demonstrating agreement or approval. Saying amen is the biblical way of saying approval or agreement or praise. Can both be used? Sure, of course, we're not offending anyone. But if I want to, you know, if I want to approve, if I wish to approve something that is biblical, I'll say amen, because amen is the biblical way to confirm something. If somebody has a 50th anniversary and somebody announces brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so have their 50th anniversary, some people applaud, well, yeah. Sure, I approve, I'm happy for you. Not necessarily a quote, biblical doctrine or a biblical thing that somebody has managed to stay married for, for 50 years. And we certainly shouldn't divide over those things, but at least let's understand the difference. One is secular and one is biblical. Okay, we'll stop there. I said we'd just do verses one to five, but this is the nature, of, there you go. So this is the nature of this class. If you've kind of come in to see what it's like, this is what it's like, line by line, verse by verse.